Hi, welcome to Archival Goodies in Odd Places. My name is Amy Cox, and I work part-time in the Marion Morrison Local History and Archives here at the Crawfordsville District Public Library. And you can see from the slide, I work with the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Deli Craig. And I do some projects up there. I work about 12 hours a month. And besides digitizing marriage records and parental consents and overseeing the newspaper project where we send newspapers off to be digitized, I also help community members with their genealogy and help Delhi with incoming inquiries when I'm here. And one more thing, if I have time, I check online marketplaces for archival items that relate to Montgomery County. So what are archival goodies? Usually these are items, they're aged or they have age to them. Although the only exception to that is if they're prominent, meaning like if they belong to a famous person. An example would be if, um, let's say the office materials of Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, let's say they they were of relevance, so um, maybe a museum wanted to keep them or something like that. They would be considered archival items, but usually they're old items. And they can be divided into two major categories, paper items and artifacts. That's my opinion. Don't quote me on it. So artifacts can be anything like the following examples, uh, pictures, art, metals, watches, jewelry, silverware, embroidered handkerchiefs, and other textiles. These are just examples. They can be so many more things. Um, they could be a baby rattle, a small baby rattle. They could be buttons. They could be um, like a little autograph book or the little card and pencil that men used to sign for a dance with a lady. Like it could be so many different things. And there are a lot of paper items too. Besides all the records that we as citizens of a community create as we go about life, there's other more social items that are donated to us here at the archives. Things like the scrapbooks, things like the genealogy, maybe it's a diary, maybe it is a set of historic books from a certain profession. Maybe we have historic newspapers donated from a certain community. Um, there, so those are specific records that are created as pieces of paper that we know are going to be created. For instance, like if you're going to get married, you know you're going to have the marriage record and um, the license that you go by. If you go to get your driver's license, you know you're going to get an ID. So those are the sort of things that can be predicted. But there's other paper items that you might not know that you are going to collect. And these paper items are called ephemera. And the definition of ephemera that I came up with is paper items that are created usually for a certain purpose, but they have a short life. So they're fragile. As I put in the slide, you could think of movie or event tickets, programs, valentines, posters and maps, but so much more. You could think of political signs or there could be a sales sign that a certain department store puts in their window. Um, think of all like all the neat cutouts and signs that 
liquor stores get that are seasonal and um, movie theaters also get large cutouts for movies and so it's have you ever wondered what happens to those items well they pop up here and there on this slide you can see the Indianapolis Indians handbook for 1935 I found this little gem in the basement of my grandparents' house. My grandfather, the basement was his domain. It's kind of like a man cave before man cave with a, was a thing. And his basement was one of those wonderful places where there were treasures galore. He was kind of the family pack rat, so things had trickled down to him from generations before, and you never knew what you were going to find. And so this was one of the little booklets that I found that I just, I liked the art, and I liked the color, and I liked that it had a sports theme, and I liked that it was local uh, to our state. So um, it's one of my little treasures I have. I'll tell you about the Icebox Cookery booklet later, but it's also a booklet too, so it's very fragile. Lots of times these don't make it through life. You know, they get torn or dirty, lost. And so these are a couple of examples of ephemera. This is another example of ephemera. It's uh, 1929, Home Canner's Yearbook. You can see it's soiled a little bit, well-loved. Um, this was not a family piece that came down to me. I found it out and about. Many times you get these little culinary booklets and they will have treasures within them. So you can see this handwritten recipe for green tomato pickles was folded into inside this home canner's yearbook. Many times there are recipes cut out of newspapers tucked into these as well and they're usually pretty aged and so they're yellowed and quite pretty I think. I love the patina on used neighbor newspapers. So you can see on this recipe, it calls for one peck of green tomatoes. I, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 70s. I, I'm a city girl. I've lived in the country, but I haven't been into farming, so I didn't know what a peck was. So if anybody else is wondering what a peck is, it's two dry gallons or eight dry quarts, and there are four pecks to a bushel. So there you go. So my favorite pieces of ephemera, as it says up there, are ones that tell a story. What you're looking at here are a few pieces of ephemera that I have that I did inherit from family members. The Royal League book, it's a small book about this, fits in the palm of my hand. And it is from my great grandfather's service in World War I. And he served in Panama and so there would be um, different things in this little booklet. It was issued by the government, so he would use it as a diary, but it also had other useful information. It could be used as an address book in the back, and then there was just more military-type information in the front, and so I inherited three of these. And then the Christmas card is uh, in the Valentine's Day card are my mom's. They were in her little, well, it's not so little, it's she, they came from her baby book, and it's like pink silk book, very pretty uh, for the first year of a baby's life. And so this uh, Christmas card is from 1952, and the Valentine's Day card is from 1953. So I just told her age. Sorry, Mom. So where can you find archival goodies? Well, I am going to show and tell you about some of the things I've found and where I have found them. I will start with this postcard. It's one of two I'm going to show you. I 
titled these, this, I titled these the Walter Beck Postcards. In anticipation of creating this program, I went into Cabbages and Kings because I wanted to just see what they had to show you that you can go into almost any antique store or mall and find some sort of archival goodie. I found these in one booth. They were mixed in with a whole other bunch of postcards and they were clearly related. I, I think there were other family, Beck family postcards in there. These two were just super charming and so um, I selected these two to buy. This one is to Walter Beck from his grandmother, one of his grandmothers. Um, it's, it's. Uh, I thought, I thought the outside of the postcard was very charming with the hunter and the dog on the front. Uh, this is postcard is circa 1908, and after doing some research, Walter is age five here. Wait, no, sorry, not age five, age three here. He was born in 1905, so he's a three-year-old boy that she's writing to. And you can see that she puts on there care of Lyndon Beck, and that's a clue, could be his dad or a family member, and indeed it was his dad. Let's see, I think that's all I had to tell you on that one. The other postcard to Walter is in 1913, and it's from his Aunt Elsie, and you can see that right up there at the top of the bottom image. It says from Aunt Elsie, as she included many clues in her postcard about herself and about the family. And on the front, you see her picture, which usually there are not pictures on postcards, and what a wonderful find that is. On the right, you can see I blew the picture up and it still had nice quality to it. So after doing a little bit of research, um, you might not be able to tell, you'd have to turn your neck sideways, but she says that her birthday is coming up on May 3rd and Walter's birthday is at the end of April. So knowing that her birthday is on May 3rd and knowing she's his aunt, I was able to figure out that her her full name was Elsie Duncan Peck. And she did live in Crawfordsville and did pass away here in Crawfordsville. So this is a picture of another archival goodie that I found at an antique store. I did not buy this one, but I took a picture of it I took a picture of it when I didn't even know I was going to do this program, but it was so cool. And I thought, well, if somebody out there might want it, there were a bunch of these, but I just took the one picture because I didn't want to get in trouble by the antique guy owner. I didn't want him to come over and ask me what I was doing. So I only took the one picture, but it, it, this is a land deed for Elisha Jones Jr. that lives in Alfred, the town of Alfred in York County, Maine. And it was all the way in Arizona. And there were other main ones as well. But you can see how big it is and original. And it was very nicely contained on a board, cardboard with cling wrap over it to keep it clean and to keep it preserved. So I did a little research on Alfred, Maine, because I'd never heard of it. And I found these couple of pictures of Alfred in 1845. And it, it was distinctive because it had a Shaker village nearby. And so the bottom picture shows you a close-up hand-drawn of the Shaker village. And then the top picture shows you the Shaker village within the town of Alfred. Another place you can find goodies is at used bookstores. The Bible on the left I found at a half price books in Indianapolis. And I just cannot resist going to a Bible and seeing if the family sections are filled out. And this one was, 
It is the Kelly Bible, and they wanted $50 for it. I did not buy it because I don't have any Kellys like that in my family, but I did. Here again, I got my camera out, and I did take pictures of the pages in the middle. It was birth records, marriage records, or birth dates, marriage dates, and death dates, and I think a miscellaneous page. The parents who were listed in here were born in the 1820s, so it it did span a nice time. It did span a nice amount of time where records are hard to find um, before the 1850 census. So this had some valuable information in it. And the family was from Pennsylvania. So what I did was I did some research online. I found a couple of people, one direct descendant and another fellow that married into the family, but two family researchers and emailed them both the pages and also told them about the Bible being for sale and sent them the the number for the store in case they wanted to call and see if they could purchase it and have it mailed to them. The right picture here is at the same store and you can see all the ephemera that's bagged up and hanging on that wall. And then to the left of that was also more ephemera, but it was holiday related. But on the bottom right corner, there was a lot of genealogical stuff in there, but all of those would be considered archival goodies because all of them, even if they're not history related or genealogy related, are archivally important to somebody. And on the right, you can also see in those containers, the bigger items that have been ziplocked and stored there for sale. So lots of times when I go into a used bookstore, if I'm not familiar with the bookstore or it's the first time I've been there, I will go up to the counter and ask them where their ephemera is located. Most of the time they know what I'm talking about. Usually if it's the owner or somebody that's in the business, they will know. If it's just somebody who works there as a clerk and and just comes in and does their shift and leaves. They, they might not know what the term is, but then, you know, I just tell them, oh, I'm looking for your, you know, your, your flimsier, lighter, thinner stuff like maps, and then they'll, in postcards, and then they'll usually point me in the right direction. So I want to show you several things that I purchased at a used bookstore in Quebec City, in Quebec, and I have a France fetish right now. I'm, I'm, I've been saving for a while to get to Paris and so I'm just ecstatic over anything. I don't know why, I don't know where it comes from, but I just, probably because i am been reading about the, the um, revolution in Paris and things like that, like it just geeks me out. So I just like it, I don't know. But anyway, these are a couple of the things that I found. Um, the 2000th anniversary it was in the early 50s so that's how old that the the one on the right is and then the one on the left is a lot older um, I couldn't get an authentic date but um, it was pretty old and there's this there was a series of these children's book and so it's called the little lamb This is another item I picked up at the same bookstore. It uh, is thin. It has a lot of these, like on the Cartier on the right, you'll see um, it, it's basically a minimalist ad for their jewelry store in Paris. And I did a little research on this and it was a jeweler's 
portion of a colonial exposition in Paris. So I believe it was either in 1925 or 1931. And I was just really attracted to this because of the Cartier ad, and there was also a um, Van Cleef and Arbol's ad in there. And, and um, sometimes I, you know, like to display stuff. So I, I bought that. It's the paper is really heavy and thick and creamy and just really quality paper. And so um, I was just very attracted to it for that reason. And we will move on to the next slide. I've got one more item to show you. This is a larger magazine type, although the cover was heavy and dark, like it didn't have, um, it had a thicker cover on it than a magazine, but it clearly wasn't a book. And so, as you can see, it's, it's got some artwork on the front. And I ended up buying this as well. I was very attracted to the mid-century ads that are in it. You can see an example right here. Uh, there was like a Rolex ad, there was a champagne ad that was very neat, um, just various ads through it. There was also a section in there on artwork and they actually had artwork that was attached, like it, it was hanging loose mostly except for one end that was attached in there and they were reproductions of famous artwork, mostly portraits and that was very neat. And so um, it was pretty cheap. I think I paid a couple dollars, so um, I bought those. So another place you can find archival goodies is flea markets. And we all know we have a big flea market that comes around in Park County every October. And that is exactly where I found this little beauty. This is a scrapbook from the 1930s. And I, when I picked it up, I was like, what is this thing? And started looking through it and it is a trip in the 1930s West and I believe it was 1933 and this couple went from Indiana, they went down through Arkansas into Texas, through New Mexico, Arizona, California and up, they made a big loop and then up through Colorado, Kansas and Illinois home. And what struck me is the the crash of 1929 sent us into a depression and here this family has, or this, this couple has enough money to go do this. So I was very curious about it. And then the fact that it was also a diary, um, they were saying it's like a travel diary. They were saying what they found. And you'll see on the next slide, there were also uh, antique or vintage postcards, almost antique um, throughout. So on here, you can see, you can see their car. Let's see, I'm looking through my notes real quick. Um, okay, it wasn't 1933, it was 1934. And let's see, some, I'll tell you some of my favorite, favorite comments on here. On June 9th, 1934, they were headed through Arkansas and whomever, I'm not sure if it's the husband or the wife, said many hillbillies, few regular guys except in Little Rock and Hot Springs, horse and mule drawn carts, Texas T-bone, 10 to 15 cents. And then on by June 12th, they were in New Mexico and they noted that there were adobe huts on the road to Carlsbad Caverns and huge herds of sheep eating, quote, I don't know, I don't know what, and looking like it. <laughs> and there was a greasy looking shepherd, apparently. 
And then on June 25th, they're in Yellowstone National Park. I mean, you can tell they're cruising around, they're cruising pretty fast through all the states. And he said, saw mother bear and two cubs being fed by tourists, cubs smooth and sleek, mother ragged. So there were some really charming descriptions through it. You can see there on one of the pictures here, on the picture on the right, you can see uh, that they're in their car. So further in the scrapbook, there is a picture of the couple right here, and you can see they look very well to do, which they would have had to been to have afforded this trip. And then this is a picture of the Grand Canyon, one of the vintage postcards that are throughout the book. I think I paid a dollar for this, and you're probably wondering what I do with all this stuff that I pick up. and. Um, I just, I enjoy it so much, but yes, I, I think um, I'm going to have to part with some things at some point. I can't take it with me, so. And at some point, my husband keeps telling me we have to downsize, so. <laughs> okay, we're back to the Icebox Cookery booklet. Um, and also another place that I like to look for archival goodies is thrift stores. The Icebox Cookery booklet here I bought at Goodwill. I was so charmed by the colors and the pattern on the front. And you'll see a lot of these booklets sometimes at a Goodwill. I think people clean out estates and drop a bunch of stuff off and so sometimes there'll be quite a few of them together. So what is so cute about this Icebox Cookery booklet is when I opened it up, it's from 1930 and let me read you a couple things. It's so charming. It said, this book is compiled by the Home Service Division of the Southwestern Ice Manufacturers Association and dedicated to the American housewife and presented to her as a token of her ice dealer's appreciation of past patronage and in anticipation of rendering future service. So how cute is that, that these were for the American housewife that was probably given to her by her ice man that would deliver the ice for her refrigerator. And yes, I, I said, I told you I'm a child of the 1970s. I heard about this, you know, that you had your ice man and your milk man, but never saw it. And so this was just a charming, charming example of, of that time era. It also said in here, in the description, it said, true progress is the liberation of a people from drudgery. And our country today is foremost of all the nations in freeing the housewife that she may be a delightful companion to her family. So there you go. Very charming. Some people might be offended by the sexism in it, whatever. It's what happened. I mean, we are women, hear us roar. We always were, we always will be, but I just find that very charming. Okay, so now we have a whole bunch of places that I like to go to besides thrift stores, garage sales. Um, you'll find archival goodies at the Friends of the Library book sales. Many times, um, I know here at the Crawfordsville District Public Library, we get donations in as well as weeding out some of the older things. And so um, from both of those places, we'll get a lot of fun things to look through. I like to go to church sales. Um, sometimes you'll have churches that run thrift stores. So you'll get like, well, like Tr Trinity that we have here in town. So you'll, you'll get those will kind of be a, a mash uh, auctions. Um, and then some places you might not have, have tried before are these online marketplaces that I peruse as part of my job here. And those are eBay, Amazon, Etsy, Mercari, and then actual used books 
booksellers, a books and biblio. And some of these markets like Mercari, you might not have heard of, um, let go, those things pop up periodically and, and time will tell if they will stick around. So what you're looking at is an example of one of the postcards that I found on eBay. I did not pay for it because um, we're not actually buying it for our collection. But as you can see, the gra just getting the graphics is nice. If you are a descendant of this particular family, you would probably be thrilled to find this. Um, but I did put the listing down there if anybody is interested out there in purchasing it. Uh, so this particular postcard is of the Carnegie Library, the original Carnegie. And it was purchased by a young lady. I think she was about 17 or 18. Her name is Ethel A. Miller. And so I'm going to proceed to the next slide and tell you a little bit more about her. So Ethel was writing to her friend, Ida Jacobson in Indianapolis. Uh, Ethel and her father, and I'm not sure if there was more in the family, but they had recently moved to Crawfordsville. Her dad ran a business in downtown Crawfordsville. And I'm going to read it to you real quick because it's probably hard for you to turn your head to see it. But she says, well, we have found a home at last, Seville. It is, and then she gives her address, 107 Vernon Court. Hurry up and write. Everyone is treating me perfectly grand, only I don't feel at home one bit. Papa's store is right downtown, directly across from post office and a square from courthouse. Write soon, lovingly, Ethel A. Miller. So I found that so charming and we do have people coming into the library to research businesses and things. And so I thought that it might be of some value, even if we don't buy the postcard, we would have the information file around or have an era in which to put it in for local businessmen. So this is a place you might not have thought of for archival goodies, and that's our contextual salvage stores. And I had the opportunity to visit the architectural salvage store that's at 96th Street and Michigan Road, uh, right there on the border of Zionsville and Indianapolis. And it's one of my favorite places to go to. If you've not been to an architectural salvage store before, uh, it is such a treat. There are pieces of architectural history just crowding these stores and, you know, anything from chandeliers to doors to windows to doorknobs. And I mean, that might not be your thing, but it's just, it's so neat. And um, this particular one had postcards. So I was thumbing through some postcards and they had a lot from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So I didn't end up buying these. These I grabbed online uh, to, to kind of show you, but these were the type that they had there. And, um, and some other ones of some different places uh, in Indianapolis. So yes, so architectural salvage stores, you. You don't know what they might have. This particular one also had artwork. So, um, you know, they, if you're not familiar with architectural salvage stores, they go in and if there's a house that's going to be demolished, they go in and take all the pieces of value out of the house before it's they're ruined and then they sell them. So you're talking about trim work and like I said, the doors and, and hardware and light fixtures and Anything that they think people might want. There might be urns or, gosh, I don't know, like uh, stained glass windows and all sorts of neat things. Okay, so I thought you might want to know 
what or where is the oddest place that I have ever found archival goodies because I have a story. Uh, we recycle at our house and I recycle the paper stuff in the paper recycling bins. And so uh, Boone County had a lot of these paper recycling bins in, in Hamilton County. So I usually have to save them for a trip over there. And so I was taking my paper recycling and throwing it in the dumpster when I saw a couple boxes and I saw like a old vintage chocolate box and I'm like, oh, what's that? And pulled the box over to me and it was full of old letters. It was full of, I mean, I think there was a death certificate in there pictures and all these wonderful mementos that someone had thrown away. And I hate to say, but I rescued it. Um, the letters, there were some World War I letters in there. There was World War II letters in there. There was Vietnam War letters in there. And this family um, ended up in Boone County, but they were from Virginia. And so uh, right now I'm just holding on to these things for just a, a little bit more time to go by so that it's not offensive to whoever threw those things away. And, um, you know, I'll probably send the stuff from Virginia to Virginia and, or inquire at Boone County. Um, I think the people moved here in their elderly years. So I think most of the value is to Virginia. So, you know, I'm, I'm holding on to it for right now, but I'll do something eventually. But this is what I this I want to show you. This picture is that um, I found this in the new, one of the old newspapers in well, it was a Crawfordsville newspaper. I think it was the Crawfordsville Weekly Review, and it was reprinted from the Indianapolis Journal. And so it's telling us that um, that down in Charlestown in 1896, they were throwing out a bunch of records from the local courthouse and the marriage record of Governor Jonathan Jennings was among was among those things just thrown out. And so someone like me probably came by and grabbed a lot of the papers to save them or whatever. And um, this is an example that you can be a governor and your record will still be thrown out and um, so, you know, this is another example of why ephemera is, is valued is because a lot of stuff doesn't make it. So I wanted to tell you also about the free things that are out there that have been digitized and for example, um, I pulled up these examples for you. I've done my husband's genealogy and he is cousins to little orphan Annie, the real little orphan Annie, Alice Gray. And so I kind of used her as a example of what you can find online. And so I've, I've given you the Library of Congress. They have a lot of things that are public domain that they have digitized and put online. The second one is called the National Union Catalog of Manuscripts Collections. And it is a catalog that is full of finding aids for places across the nation. And so you might be able, like for instance, I put a name in there in the search box and it pulls up any, um, any archival collection piece that has that last name. So for instance, um, I put in William Bratton for when I was writing uh, my biography on William Bratton and his cousin, who's also named William Bratton, popped up and he, William R. Bratton, was writing letters from Crawfordsville, here in Crawfordsville in the 1830s and sending them to his friend in Virginia. Well, his friend must have kept them and the next generation must have kept them because they ended up at an archive in Virginia. And so um, it let me know that these were part of this Michael Wise collection and I was able to send off for it. And so that's why I wanted to let you know about the NUCMC. 
lots of times state archives and university archives will have things as well. And that's, as you see here are the examples, the um, James Wickham Riley photo here, he's surrounded by children. It's 1916 and he's at his house in Lockerbie Square in Indianapolis. And this was from the um, Indiana State Library Digitals collection. But this other picture of Little Orphan Annie, the book cover collection, um, or the book cover is a picture from the IEPY University Library collection. And then again, um, the house below it, where Alice Gray lived over in Hancock County uh, was taken by a photographer in 1927, and he has a collection that is housed in the Lilly Library at IU in Bloomington. So you can see, uh, you can, by the time different archives have different things, it's worth looking to see what's out there. I can tell you another example. For me, um, in doing my genealogy, I went down to Mississippi in 2009 from a grant from um, L the Lilly Foundation. And I was going down there to um, find out where our family plantations were and to get a GPS location so that that information wasn't lost a few generations. We had a couple of elder elderly cousins down there that weren't married and did not have children. So I was worried about that information being lost. So I went down there to research and at the Jackson, Mississippi archives, which is their state archives, there was a folder with plantation records for one of the plantations. However, I later found out that a picture of the pl the original plantation house was not included in those plantation records, but it was in another collection and I did not know about it at the time. But uh, the famous photographer and essayist uh, author Eudora Welty was a visitor at the plantation when she was the roommate of one of the um, girls uh, by the last name of Mitchell. And so she had happened to take the photo, but the photo of the plantation house was in her collection, in the Eudora Welty collection. So I know that little archival goodie is sitting down there and I just need to send off for it. So you just never know what you're going to find. So this brings me to the question, besides, um, you know, maybe finding archival goodies for genealogy purposes or family purposes. What can you do with ephemera? That's the big question. Well, one of the things that I've done is frame this floral postcard over here. Um, it is from Hamilton County, I believe from 1913. And I just love the flowers and I love the colors. And so um, I framed it in this cute little vintage frame and I have it sitting in my bedroom. One of my friends, she found a postcard to somebody in Darlington and she lives in Darlington. So this postcard that you see on the left is actually huge. She had it blown up and printed off and it's a huge piece of artwork in her bedroom and super cool. And um, it, it's a real statement piece and so I didn't even know that something like that could be blown up that big with that much detail, but that's what they can do these days. So um, very cool. So we've reached the end and I wanted to give you some additional resources. Uh, a lot of these are uh, from Indiana and for instance, Wabash had the Lou Wallace photo at the bottom, but the um, these botanical prints were at Butler. And so no matter what your interest is, there are archival goodies out there that you can either, you know, buy on an online marketplace or let's say, you know, you'd want to print off one of the botanical prints and on your color printer and frame it. So, um, I yeah, so I, I think there's a value for ephemera for everybody. I mean, some people want to, you know, buy the original and, and frame it and that's, that's um, 
the hunt for those things is fun too. So I hope everybody out there enjoyed this program and um, thank you very much for attending.